Last week, California's Democrat governor signed into law two pro-abortion bills. One of the bills, signed by Gavin Newsom, allows for abortions and, quote, gender-affirming care to be kept confidential from insurance policyholders. In most cases, that means that minors can obtain the services without parental consent. One report says that Planned Parenthood provides resources instructing teens on how to hide abortions from their parents. Joining me now is Roger Severino, Senior Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Roger, welcome. Great to see you. Um, let's talk more about these bills, uh, which in part allow girls to get abortions in California without their parents even knowing. I'd like to get your reaction and the dangers it creates for children and the family unit. Yeah, this is driving a wedge between parents and their kids. Unfortunately, so many bad things are coming out of California. I grew up there. It's just sad to see. Attorney General Javier Becerra, who's now the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, was there when he mandated abortion insurance for all Californians, practically speaking. Uh, and uh, under the Trump administration, we went after him for violating the law and having that mandate. And now he's following this up by saying you could actually hide abortion charges in insurance. And the state of California, for their part, is doing the exact same thing by saying insurance companies can't tell parents when their kids are getting abortions and where they're getting sex reassignment surgeries, that's just bad public policy. You can't have these life-altering decisions being made without parental involvement. Yeah, absolutely. It really is concerning. And, and additionally, as you mentioned, the bill also mentions that the uh, sensitive services include, quote, gender-affirming care. I'd like to talk more about that. And also, how is this all even legal? Sure. So there's a question as to whether or not a child could actually consent to a sex reassignment surgery. We saw in England there was massive debate whether or not somebody could actually consent as a child, and they stopped it for a time. Also, in the Nordic countries, they're reevaluating this. In the United States, it's full steam ahead. You could have life-altering, permanently sterilizing surgeries as a child, and I don't think a child could consent to that. When in 90% of the cases, if kids are left alone, they grow out of it out of their, on their own. However, if you cut out parents from the equation, then that just leaves childs to their own devices. You need to be able to have the parents involved in these very, very tough circumstances where kids are going through all sorts of confusion as teens, as and we want to help them accept their bodies. And if you cut out the parents from, from that, you're violating not only the rights of the parents, but the rights of the kids to be fully informed before they take these life-altering decisions. They're driving parents out and putting the government in. California is wrong to do this. The Biden administration is also wrong to support it, and that's what they're doing. Hmm. Well, in Washington, as you know, uh, the U.S. House passed the Pro-Abortion Women's Health Protection Act last week as a response to the Texas heartbeat law. Uh, was this purely symbolic, or do you think it actually has a chance of becoming law? I think the chances are slim. There is still enough pro-life sentiment, thankfully, in the Senate, and even among some very few vanishingly small Democrats that will say it's too far. We saw that even Susan Collins said it was too far, and even she's in support of Roe versus Wade. So we're seeing a very big pushback. They're not going to get to the 60 votes necessary. But we see that Planned Parenthood is doing, is the administration is doing the bidding of Planned Parenthood. It's political payback. They were huge supporters of the Biden administration, huge supporters of the Democrats in Congress. And that's what this is all about. It's about political payback. Rajan, I have a lot of time left, but before I let you go, um, I want to talk about this. The Supreme Court is gearing up to hear the Dobbs case in December. I'm wondering, how do you expect that case uh, to affect the pro-life movement? How do you see this all shaking out? Well, the pro-life movement should be energized. We are finally getting Roe v. Wade to be decided. And I think it's on the chopping block. It's been eroded for decades, and it is egregiously wrong. Not just wrong, egregiously wrong. And I think the Supreme Court justices are now have a majority who are willing to agree with that fact and undo the harm so that states can now finally move forward to defend human life, the most vulnerable among us. And it won't end just with the Dobbs case. We have cases about abortion based on a child's Down syndrome status. A disability should never be a death sentence, and I think the justices should take up that case as well and down the line. But first and foremost, I think they're going to readdress Roe, and I think there's a, a fantastic chance that Roe will finally go. Oh, Roger, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you weighing in. Roger Severino, Senior Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Thank you again. Thank you.